Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the previous lecture, I explained the significance of filling our kalb with the love of God, filling it up with divine love. And I explained that this is really what activates the lub. It, it is really the core or the energy source of the entire heart. And when the heart is activated and it is filled with God's love, then it emits this uh, positive energy, which kind of uplifts every cell in the human body. And that is when you feel contentment and peace. And I also explained that one of the best means of filling your heart with the love of God is by um, basically pondering and reflecting on your past. So reflect on all the moments in your life when you were faced with difficulty and hardship and how God's mercy was so evident, how it was through Allah's mercy that Allah was able to get you out of all those difficult situations. So really, instead of focusing on how you got into those difficult situations, focus on how you were able to get out of it. And that's where you will discover Allah's mercy. This is what it means to reflect and to attain wisdom. And this is precisely the kind of activity that activates our lub. Now, Surah Doha is really a practical manifestation of everything that I have just said. So this is a surah that was revealed in the early Makki period. And the reason why it is a brilliant example of how we can fill our hearts with the love of the divine is because it's a surah that was introduced during a moment in time when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was feeling very sad and very depressed. In fact, he was feeling grief over the past and fear of the future. So in specific, it's believed that after the first few revelations were given to the Prophet through Jibreel a.s., there came a moment when revelation ceased. And this was a very difficult time for the Prophet because prior to this, every time he would receive a revelation, it was his job to pass on the information, to pass on the verses to everyone else. And we know that during his time uh, in Mecca, the people of Quraysh were very hostile towards his message. They did not like the verses that he was explaining to everyone else. They did not like the fact that it was captivating many people. And in specific, the fact that it was talking about one God and that all human beings, all slaves are equal in the eyes of Allah. So it really was taking away the power that the, the Quraysh had assumed in the entire Arab region by calling themselves the keepers of the Kaaba. You know, so this was a tribe that had assumed a very high status in the entire Arab region by promoting this concept that they were keepers of the Kaaba. They had been selected by the gods and therefore their status is superior to everyone else. And the Prophet's message was actually taking away their status because the Prophet's message is that all slaves are equal in the eyes of Allah and the only entity that should be given any superior status is God himself. So of course they were very hostile towards his message. And as a result, when this period of time came, when revelation stopped, they used it as a brilliant opportunity to mock the Prophet and to make him feel as if God the Almighty must be angry with you because suddenly he has stopped sending you any form of revelation. Now, of course, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, given the excellent amount of Iman that he had, initially he was able to endure this difficulty. So he was able to fight all the, the negativity that was surrounding him, all the nasty and mean comments that people were, were giving him. And he was hopeful that eventually revelation will come. But as the time kept getting longer, you know, the, the negativity starts to get to you. So when you are in an environment where you are surrounded by people who are mocking you and they're making fun of you, and they're trying to instill fear inside of you that your God has forsaken you, your God has abandoned you, he's not pleased with you, and perhaps he's going to now choose somebody else as his prophet. When you are surrounded by words like this, it eventually gets to you. Even for a man like Muhammad, peace be upon him, with his brilliant amount of Iman, it does eventually start to affect you. And you start to ponder and think that maybe Allah has in fact abandoned me. Maybe Allah is very upset with me. And so what it starts to inculcate is fear of the future. So in other words, if God the Almighty has now left me, then what is my fate going to be when I'm standing in front of him uh, during the Akhirah? During the Day of Judgment, there is no way that I can possibly be saved because the only entity that can save me has abandoned me. And then on top of that, not just the Akhirah, but even in this dunya, when all these people now have so much hatred towards me, who is possibly going to save me from these people because God has abandoned me? So it inculcates fear of the future. At the same time, it inculcates grief of the past. 
So you start thinking about everything that you endured in the past. All those times when Allah sent you revelation, you passed it on to the people. The people started to give you nasty and mean comments. And then you slowly start to slip into that victim mode where you start to think, you know, my life before this was actually quite good in the sense that I was known as being the most trustworthy, the most honest. People uh, had all these uh, respectful words for me. And now suddenly they're calling me a liar, a poet and a sorcerer. And I did all of this for God. And now God has left me. So you have this immense grief over what has happened to you in the past. You have immense fear of the future. And you can imagine what this does to an individual who has nobody to turn to because he is surrounded by all kinds of negativity and hopelessness. And don't forget that for a man like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, living in the environment that he was in, whenever he received revelation, it was his means of, it was the only means by which he could boost that positive energy inside of him. He felt incredibly good, incredibly happy whenever he received revelation because the words of God, they just boosted his heart. They filled it up with positivity. And that's why he was able to endure all those difficult moments in Makkah alone. So now imagine when that basic source of your positive energy revelation itself has ceased and now you're surrounded by negativity, eventually your own stock of positive energy starts to deplete, it becomes less and less and eventually you just don't have it in you to face the people anymore. You, you just don't have that energy anymore to be able to struggle in the cause of Allah and all the negative words of people, they start to get to your mind. They start to affect you and slowly the prophet was slipping in it towards depression now different narrations express a different amount of time during which this revelation had ceased some say perhaps it was 15 days some say 25 and some even suggest it was 40 days but in any case it was a prolonged period of time where the uh, the negativity kept building up and muhammad peace be upon him was incredibly down and very very sad and it was in this moment then that Allah revealed the beautiful Surah Duha to him. And what you see in this Surah is that the first thing Allah does is he takes an oath and he swears by the morning brightness and he swears by the night when it covers everything with darkness. And after taking both of these oaths, he says, your Lord has not uh, forsaken you, Muhammad, peace be upon him, nor does he hate you, nor does he detest you. Now, you have to understand that when you're taking an oath on something, there has to be some relevance between the things you are taking an oath uh, upon and the statement that you are giving after the oath. So, for instance, you know, when we say that uh, I swear upon my life that I am telling you the truth, then there is some link between both of these things. In other words, I am trying to convince you that I am telling you the truth and my level of conviction is so much that I am willing to swear on my life, right? So that just shows how serious I am and that convinces the person who's listening that she must be telling the truth. On the other hand, if I said, I swear upon the stars, I swear upon the moon that I am telling the truth, there's no relevance. And so it doesn't really prove anything. It doesn't have any impact on the person who's listening. So in this case, since Allah is taking an oath by the morning brightness and by the night when it covers everything in darkness, there has to be some link between these things and the statement that he's giving, which is the fact that Allah does not, has not abandoned you, nor does he detest you. Now, when you start pondering over these verses, when you start really reflecting and asking questions, what you realize is that Allah is telling us, that just like the daytime, you know, the morning brightness. And it's interesting he uses the word doha because he's not talking about the first ray of light, you know, that, that appears during the time of Fajr. He's not talking about that first ray of light. He's talking about a time when there is a lot of brightness everywhere. So this is really uh, during the daytime. And then he swears uh, by the night and the fact that it covers everything with complete darkness. So on the one hand, he's talking about the time when everything is uh, filled with light and there's a lot of brightness. And on the other occasion, the complete opposite, the complete contrast where everything is engulfed with complete darkness. And what you understand is that Allah is telling you, yes, things are contrasted. 
right? So there is a contrast between day and night. There is a contrast between black and white. But at the same time, there is hikmat, there is wisdom, and there is beauty in everything that Allah has introduced. So there is beauty in having complete brightness as well, because morning is a time when we are involved in all our daily activities. We can go out, we can work, we can earn sustenance, we can go to the market. So many essential and so many important activities that we can only perform during the daytime. But at the same time, it's very beneficial to have this prolonged period of nighttime as well, because that's when we get to rest. That's when you have peace and calmness. You know, you're away from all the hustle bustle during the daytime. And not only can your body relax and rest, but through that calmness and tranquility that you have at night, you can reflect on what happened during the day. So really, you know, the only moment in time that we have when, when we can actually think back on, on the things that were said to us, the things that we did, the way that we behaved, that is during the nighttime. When everything, everyone has gone away, we are completely alone and now we have time to peacefully and calmly think back and reflect, right? And this is a moment in time when we really learn the most amount in terms of, you know, the mistakes that we have made. This is a time when we, we realize um, the, the sins we might have committed, the need to do tawbah, the need to reconnect with Allah. That's why even the time of the hajjat is considered to be so important because there's peace and calm. And so in that moment in time, you're really able to connect with God and that's how you are able to reflect within yourselves and become a better version. So now when you understand these two oaths that, that Allah is taking and what really Allah is emphasizing when he talks about brightness and when he talks about night that is completely quiet and filled with darkness, you can now appreciate why Allah is saying that your Lord has not forsaken you. In other words, he's telling the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that there is benefit uh, of uh, having a moment in time when you have a lot of revelation that is being given to you. And there is a benefit of having a moment in time when revelation has ceased. There is khair in that too. Because when revelation is coming to you, it is not only very physically straining for the Prophet. And we know this from the Hadith as well and from the Sunnah that every time the Prophet would receive revelation, it was a huge burden on his physical human body. It was actually very, very exhausting for him to even receive a, a few verses through Jibreel a.s. So not only is it physically straining, but then imagine he has to now go out in public and he has to convey the message only to face a lot of emotional abuse only to be mocked and ridiculed. So it's not like people will appreciate him. It's not like people, uh, you know, will understand the, the difficulty that he just went through in order to just receive that revelation. But instead, they will end up making fun of him. And at no point is he allowed to keep the revelation to himself. He still has to go out and he has to propagate the, the entire message. So Allah said, telling the Prophet that, you know, during those initial revelations, it was a huge burden and a huge strain on you. Just like during the daytime when there's so much activity, that activity is important for us. We can perform lots of essential tasks, but you know we need nighttime because things get exhausting. We need time to just um, you know, be on our own, to calm down, to have peace and tranquility. Otherwise, our energy source is depleted. So just as we need daytime, we also need a period of nighttime. And this is what Allah was telling the Prophet that you've had that period of hustle bustle and it has been very physically and emotionally straining on you. Because don't forget, this is like the early period of, of Makkah. So it's not like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had you know quite a few Muslims at that time who uh, had embraced Islam or who were supporting him. This is a very, very early period where he might have had just a handful of maybe four or five people who were supporting him and that's it. And plus, you know, when you have just embraced prophethood, when you have just gone out and started to give the message, you're not expecting the people who loved you to suddenly start hating you. You're not expecting people who, you know, uh, who said all kinds of nice and kind words to you to suddenly start saying meanful and hateful comments towards you. That's the last thing that, that you're expecting. And so even though he was a prophet, he was a human being. And so in those initial years, it was very straining for him to see this kind of hate and negativity towards him, which he could not possibly have uh, expected. 
And that's why Allah is saying that given your physical and emotional state right now, it is important for you to rest. And the only way that he can rest is by not receiving revelation. So that not only is the physical strain gone, but at the same time, he doesn't have to go out and speak about all the, these verses that he has just received because he hasn't received anything. So it was a time for him to just calm down, to be able to uh, you know, energize himself once again, because Allah is saying there was wisdom in not receiving anything. This was the beautiful lesson that he was being taught. Now, besides this very important oath that Allah has taken, Allah then proceeds to give the Prophet the comforting words that he really wants to hear. So yes, he has heard that Allah has not forsaken you. Yes, he has even heard that Allah does not hate you. But on top of that, there is more comforting words that Allah knows he needs to hear. And so Allah says, what is coming later is better for you than, than the first. Now, this can be interpreted in two ways. This could mean that Allah is, first of all, uh, giving the Prophet this good news that the Akhirah is going to be amazing for you. So this fear you have of the Day of Judgment, this fear you have of you know, what's going to happen to you when you're standing in front of Allah, be rest assured your Akhirah is going to be amazing and it's going to be a life far better than, than the life you are having right now. But at the same time, what it also means is that what is coming later is far better than what you have now. And that could also mean that Allah was giving him this good news that right now people do not like you. Right now you have very few followers. And it seems like, you know, this mission of spreading Islam and uh, informing everyone about this good news is going to be virtually impossible. But Allah is giving him this assurity that what is coming later on is something amazing. You will be having a city of your own. You will be having an ummah of your own. You will be building an Islamic empire of your own. There is a lot more good that is coming, right? And this is a beauty. Now, does Allah explain in detail what exactly is coming? He doesn't. He doesn't give him a hint that there will be an ummat and there will be a city and there will be an Islamic empire. There's no details given. And he does not even give a time frame. So he does not say, okay, give it another 15 years. Give it another 12 years. There's no time frame that is explained. He just says what's coming is greater and better for you than what you have right now. And that's why he, he follows it up by saying, and your Lord is going to give you and you will be satisfied. So there is a lot of abundance. There is a lot of bounty and blessings that, that is going to come, not just in the Akhirah, but even in this dunya. And it's going, going to be so much that this grief that you're feeling right now, this depression that, that you're actually experiencing right now, and this confusion as well, the fact that your own people are calling you such bad names, all of that is going to change and you will be held with a lot of honor. But as you can see, since there's no time frame that that's being given, for a man like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, now this is great news. So suddenly this is comforting and this is uplifting for him. But Allah did not tell him that you will have to wait almost 12 years for this good news to actually be practically implemented. There is a year of sadness that is also coming. Your wife will eventually pass away. Your uncle will eventually pass away. You will have to face humiliation and taif. These things are not told to him. But he's just told that what's coming later is far better. So don't worry, you will get things that will make you very, very happy. And this is a very important lesson that we learn here, is that he now has to hold on to this message of hope. And Allah is testing him by not giving him a time frame. He has not said 10 years or 12 years. So as the situation got worse uh, in Makkah, as he ended up losing his wife as well as his uncle, as he ended up facing more humiliation, such as what he faced in Taif, he just has to hold on to this hope that was given to him during the early Makki period, that life is going to get better. And the when and the how is not mentioned, but just the fact that it is, that's what he has to hold on to. That was his test, and that is precisely the way that Allah works with us. It is having that conviction, that determination that my Lord is not the kind of God who abandons his slave. My Lord is not the kind of Lord who is oblivious of the struggles that I'm actually going through. You know, he understands my fears. He understands my grief. He understands my really tough and difficult circumstances. And he is going to reward me. I know that for certain. And it is a, it's a reward that will not just come in the Akhirah. It's going to come in this dunya too. 
that is the conviction which the Prophet was being taught and that is the message that we are being given as well. So what you see is that it's not just Allah giving Muhammad peace be upon him this great news. He's also training him, he's grooming him, he is making him understand what blind trust means. That when Allah has given you these beautiful words, now trust him. And when life after this becomes more difficult, don't doubt God's words. Don't think, okay, well, Allah said this, but it doesn't seem to be actually happening. Don't doubt yourself and do not doubt the words of God. If goodness is coming, then it's coming. Now, interestingly, uh, as you move on, you see that now Allah is uh, teaching the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's actually giving him a lesson to make him understand that, you know, God is not someone that you should ever have doubts about or that, you know, you should ever think that this is a God who might even forsake you or who might even abandon you or even worse, he might hate you. And if you see the structure of the surah, it's beautiful because Allah does not start with the lesson. He starts with the words of, com of comfort. He starts with taking oaths. He gives the words that the Prophet needs to hear and then the lesson actually starts. And this is beautiful because what you learn in this is Allah understands how the heart aches. He understands how much grief and pain there is in the heart. And he knows that if I were to just jump in and start giving this heart an entire lecture, it's not going to pay attention. It's not going to learn anything. It's not going to absorb my words because there are certain things that the heart first needs to hear. If it doesn't hear those words, it's not going to absorb anything. You know, it's like for me to give you an example, if you are really perturbed and you're very upset about, about, for instance, your exam. Okay, so you just gave your exam and you're not sure if you have passed or not. And that is going to determine your entire future, your career, everything. So you are very upset about that. And your, your actual grades have not yet come, but the teacher who has to mark the paper, she comes up to you. Now, if she starts giving you this entire lecture that, okay, this is how you should have answered the paper. These are the questions that you should have focused on first. This is how time management should have been done in the exam. She's teaching you, and these are things that will help you in the future, but you're not going to pay attention to what she's saying because all you're thinking is, did I pass the exam or not? Is she telling me all of these things because I failed? You know, and so because you're paranoid about the exam grades, you're not paying attention to what she's saying. But if she starts off by giving you the good news, I guess what you passed. And now you are relieved. Now, if she tells you about time management and about focusing on, on certain questions first and so on and so forth, you will listen to everything that she said because your heart has heard the words that it needed to hear. This is what Allah is doing with the Prophet. So he starts off by giving him this guarantee, I do not hate you, I'm not upset with you, I have never abandoned you, nor will I ever abandon you. And what's coming later, your life right now is incredibly tough, but what's coming later is incredibly good. It's going to really make you happy. And now he has the sukoon that he needs, and so the lesson starts. And what does Allah tell him? Well, first of all, he asks him a series of rhetorical questions. Allah says, did he not find you an orphan and give you refuge? So we know that by the time the Prophet had been born, his father had, had already passed away. And we know that his mother subsequently passed away when he was approximately six years old. So then he was raised initially by his grandfather. And then when his grandfather passed away, he was raised by his uncle, Abu Talib, who happened to be the chief of the Banu Hashim tribe. So even though uh, he was an orphan, he was given a lot of love and care throughout his life. And this is something that Allah ensured. Uh, it's not that, you know, he had a life filled with abuse or he was, uh, he had a life where uh, he was uh, shown a lot of neglect and ignorance. Uh, Allah gave him a life that was filled with love and care. It, it could not have been from his parents, but it came from people within his family. So he did not have to worry about that. That's why Allah says that you were an orphan, you were given shelter. You were given love, you were given care. All these things, of course, came from Allah. Allah ensured that he was given all of, all of those things. And then Allah says, and he found you lost and guided you. So in this case, Allah is telling the Prophet to just focus on the fact that during the period of ignorance, you know, it really hurt you when you would see the kind of things happening in Arabia. The fact that there were people who were worshiping idols, there was a lot of abuse towards women, a lot of abuse towards orphans, 
Nobody really understood the purpose of their life. Nobody even cared. Nobody seemed to be asking the more important questions. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, would be so perturbed that he really wanted to connect with God and he just did not know how to. He was asking the more important questions already. So he understood that our life could not have been this for just no reason. I mean, if, if there's going to be injustice and there's going to be oppression, there has to be some consequence of this. I mean, is this why God created all of us, that so we can go around oppressing people and, and then eventually just die? So he was already asking very important questions, and he would often go to, to the cave and in order to get complete seclusion and isolation from everyone so he could meditate and he could just think. You know, he could somehow uh, figure out a way of connecting with God because that's what gave him peace. And so Allah tells him that you were seeking guidance, you were longing for guidance, you were longing for some kind of connection with God so your heart could feel sukoon, contentment and peace. And then I guided you. I chose you. You became my prophet. I gave you revelation and I gave you the precise guidance that you were looking for, the precise answers to your questions that you were seeking. And then Allah says, and he found you poor and made you self-sufficient. He made you free of need. So in other words, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because by the age of six, he had lost both his parents, he was actually quite poor. Although he was being looked after by his family, his grandfather and his uncle, he was quite poor in the sense that the only assets he, he had in fact inherited from his parents was uh, one she camel and one slave. That's it. So it's not like he had a lot of gold or he had a lot of assets. And so Allah is saying, when you were so poor, did I not uh, give you a life that was free of need? And what that means is eventually he formed a partnership in the thriving business of Hazrat Khadija. Hazrat Khadija, she was in charge of the business. She really um, looked up to the Prophet in the sense that he was a man of his word. He was honest, hardworking. And so she offered him partnership in uh, her business. And then subsequently, she even offered to, to marry him. She showed interest in marrying him and after their marriage was done. So now, you know, he has, he has wealth, he has a great business and he has a beautiful companion. So Allah is saying, did I not give you a situation where you were poor, but then suddenly you became free of need? You actually had everything. And of course, who was giving you all of that? It was only God. It was only Allah. So then Allah, as a result of asking these rhetorical questions, he then says, so now what should you do as for the orphans? Don't oppress the orphans. And of course, this is the part where the message is being given to all of us. Do not oppress the orphans. Therefore, just like Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an orphan and how Allah granted that orphan refuge, our job is to look after orphans. Just as Muhammad, peace be upon him, was seeking for guidance and therefore Allah gave him guidance and Allah also gave him all kinds of resources so that he became free of need. We also, as is mentioned in verse 10, as for the petitioner, do not repel him, which means if someone comes to you asking for money, do not disregard uh, his, his issues and his problems. Try and help him as much as you can. And if somebody comes to you seeking guidance, then help them as much as you can. And at the same time, Allah says, as for the favor of your Lord, report it. So go and express how much Allah has blessed you, how many times Allah has helped you, speak about it as much as you can. Because the more you speak about it, not only will you be able to uplift other people, but you will be able to remind yourself the more you talk about it that Allah has always been there for you. So the lesson that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was being taught in these verses, and of course the lesson that is being taught to us, is that through these rhetorical questions, ask yourself, does this seem like a God who abandons? Does this seem like a God who simply leaves his slave and, and moves on because the slave has not done enough? On the contrary, in all these three situations that Allah has explained, the time when the Prophet was an orphan, when he was in need because he was poor, and when he was seeking guidance, all these three were not choices that he made. He did not choose to be an orphan. He did not choose to be, um, you know, be in a situation where he's living in a, uh, in a city, in a region filled with ignorance. He did not choose to be poor. These were things that were, that were put on him. These were moments of tests and difficulties and hardship that Allah had imposed on him. Allah had placed it on him. But what Allah was teaching him is that if Allah can put these tests on you, then it is only Allah that can remove the test from you and he will remove it from you. Allah is not the type of God who actually throws tests on his slave and then he watches them slowly suffer, suffocate, 
he enjoys it, and at the end, he doesn't even help his slave. So his slave just quietly just dies while suffocating. That's not God. That's not Allah. What he does is, even though he does throw a test on you, and there is a moment of grief, there is a moment of sadness, the test will be removed, and that is inevitable. But it will be removed when Allah knows that this is the best time for the test to be removed because his slave has learned what he needs to learn. That is the entire process. That is why our life has so much difficulty, so much challenges. And it is through that learning process that we will stop fearing the future. We will stop grieving over the past. When we learn the things that Allah wants us to learn. You know, it's like when you go to school, it's impossible for you to just attend school for one month and suddenly go from preschool to becoming a, a top-notch graduate. You have to go through that process of years and years of study. And every year, whatever is taught to you are things that you need to know at that time. And it's through that process, it's through that journey that you come out to be a person who's intellectual, who understands uh, the very basics and at the same time, someone who has attained knowledge, someone who has attained wisdom. So in the same way, Allah was teaching the Prophet and of course through the Prophet he's teaching us that to have no fear of the future and to have no grief of the past is not just something which Allah can inject inside of you and suddenly the fear is gone and the grief is gone. It is through the tests and hardships that you start to realize that if Allah has always been there for me, what makes me think Allah will no longer be there for me? If Allah has always helped me in the situations that I have been in the past, what makes me think, what makes me so certain that Allah will no longer help me now and I'm doomed? It doesn't make any sense. If he's always been there for you in the past, he's certainly going to be there for you now. So why fear the future? And in the same way, why grieve over the past? Whatever has happened in the past, there were beautiful lessons to learn from those things. It was through those lessons that we learned to be strong. We learned resilience. We learned about conviction. It is through our hardships and our moments of grief that we learn to survive. Right? Being a survivor can only happen when you are put in a situation where you have to learn to survive. If you're always happy and if you always get uh, everything that you want, it doesn't make you a survivor. So just as I said in the very beginning of this lecture, what Allah was teaching the Prophet is don't focus on the fact that you were made an orphan or, or the fact that you were made poor or the fact that you were put in a region that was filled with ignorance. Instead, focus on how Allah removed you from each of those things. So focus on the fact how Allah made you free of need. Focus on the fact how Allah was able to give you the guidance and the answers to your questions that you were seeking. And focus on the fact how Allah was able to give you refuge and he was able to give you love and care despite being an orphan in a region which was known for hating orphans, in a region which was known for oppressing the, the rights of orphans. So always focus not on how you got into those tests, but how you were able to get out of those tests. And that's when you realize it actually wasn't you. You were not capable of, of getting yourself out. It was no less than a miracle. That's how our mindset is able to change and we're able to realize that if God's always going to be there, then why fear the future? Then why grieve over the past? Now, overall, what does that mean for us? When we are in a situation where at times it's the career, it's the marriage, it's the grades, you know, there's so many things that we are struggling and we're trying to control the situation, but we're not able to control it and we're slipping into depression. What this surah tells us is, first of all, stop trying to control the situation because you cannot control it. If the Prophet could control uh, the amount of, of revelation that he received, he would have ensured that there was never a moment where revelation ceased. If the Prophet could control his life, he would have ensured perhaps that he was never an orphan. These are things that you cannot control. So stop trying to even control it. The more you try and control it, the more you'll lose and the more depressed you will end up becoming. So instead, learn to do zikr. Instead, learn to do istikhara, where you're asking Allah, Allah, guide my heart and show me what is the best thing to do. Learn to trust your instincts. Learn to trust the strengths and qualities that Allah has given you. And then learn to trust God as well. And once you have made your decision about what you think you should do, Never look back, because when you look back, that is when you have regret. That's when you start to grieve over the past. 
if you have really understood yourself and you have put Allah first, you've put Allah first in terms of zikr and istikhara, then make your decision knowing that this is what I feel in my heart. This is what Allah is guiding me towards. Then move in that direction and don't ever look back and grieve over the past. On the contrary, you should have this conviction that Allah has the power to change my fate in one second. So I chose this path, I chose this decision based on my istikhara, based on my zikr, based on the fact that I felt Allah was guiding me towards this. Therefore, Allah has the power to change everything. Allah has the power to rewrite my fate. Allah has the power to make my life incredibly easy now and Allah will do that. It is that expectation that the slave has of God, which is what God loves the most. This is what the surah was teaching the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and this is what the surah is teaching us. That the Prophet, despite all his difficulties, he was being told what's coming is actually very good because whatever you're doing, whatever struggle you're enduring, you're doing it for God. And God is not oblivious. He understands that. So when we make decisions in our life, putting God as number one, putting him as a priority, God loves that and he understands that. So he can change your fate. He can put blessings in your life. Don't look back and start grieving over the past or blaming other people for your fate. Don't fear and be terrified of the future. Don't become so indecisive that you have no idea what to do. Calm down. Put your love and your trust in God. Do as much zikr and istikhara as you can and then trust the instincts of your heart because it is in your heart that lies the ruh and it is that ruh that has the connection with God. That ruh is the thing that is going to guide you towards what should be done. And once you have made your decision and you're moving on that path, if life becomes difficult, it becomes more difficult, that does not mean that your choice was wrong. That does not mean that you fall into despair and, and you look back and think, that's it, my life is over. The Prophet's life after this period when Surah Doha was revealed actually became 10 times worse. But he never looked back because he knew Allah has given me a promise. That's the promise I'm going to follow. In the same way, when you do zikr and you study the Quran, Allah gives you the consolation that your heart needs. But, that, but then once the consolation has come, then follow the lessons that Allah is teaching you in the same way that Allah first consoled the Prophet's heart and then he taught him what he, what he needs to learn. So when you study the Quran and you do zikr, Allah is consoling your heart at that time. Your heart that is broken up into pieces, Allah is putting it back together again. But then once he's consoled it, you need to learn to move on. You need to learn to move forward. So learn the lessons Allah is teaching you and learn conviction, learn tawakkal, learn to have blind faith. Because remember, while your situation is not in your control and you're not supposed to control that, being able to improve your conviction and your tawakkal and your taqwa and your love for God, that is perfectly in your control. And that is exactly what Allah wants you to focus on. So Allah is telling you, don't focus on changing your situation. Leave that to me. Focus on building that love of God inside your heart. That is perfectly in your control. May Allah help us all to fill our hearts with the love of God. May Allah help us all to understand Him so we can have tawakkul. We can have firm conviction and determination. We can be saved from depression and all kinds of negativity. And may Allah make it easy for us to attain salvation. Assalamu alaikum.